Happy Thursday, everyone. It's Jessica Dupuy, and I'm uh, with you today to talk about the new book I just put out, The Wines of Southwest USA, through uh, the Classic Wine Library. And um, today, I'm going to be joined by a friend of mine from uh, the northern part of Texas. Hey, how you doing over there in El DJ? Nice to see you. Um, and I'm going to wait for her to join us. Her name is Elizabeth Hill, and uh, looks like she is on the scene. Hold on one second while I, while I um, at her. Here we go. All right, we'll check her connection. Um, so today, hey, hey, hey there you are. how's it going? Uh, good, how are you? I am good. I'm loving your background. Very on point. Yes, this is the best place to take a picture or video or anything in our house. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, um, I'm super glad to get to talk to you today. Um, I have been thinking a lot about you guys um, up in the High Plains. It's been a little cold. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been concerning because that's what happened last year is we had a freeze right around Halloween that damaged um, pretty much all of the crop for us anyway. And so uh, my husband, Chase, who is the vineyard expert for us, he hopes that the days leading up when we got cooler, I think we got down to in the 30s leading up to it, that hopefully that helped some. Okay. I guess you just have to be optimistic in any, any kind of farming, but definitely wine grape farming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm definitely um, rooting for you guys. I know it looks like y'all got some precipitation, which is helpful, but yeah. yes. Actually, that is better, as he tells me, that um, if it was going to get that cold, that there was precip precipitation with it. So I don't completely understand that, but <laughs> I, I'm just like, whatever works, that's great. <laughs> yeah, let's just get, let's have a good outcome. Absolutely. Yes. Well, and um, so before we get too deep into all of that discussion, let's, I just would love to kind of give framework here and a little bit of background on you. So uh, tell me about Elizabeth Hill and how in the world you got into Texas wine, because it, it's probably not something you would have expected, right? No, no. I, um, you know, I ventured into wine probably about 13 or 14 years ago. Um, like many people do, I just tried some of the sweeter wines. Uh, I loved my, I joke about how my taste back then was a lot less expensive and we just ended <laughs> up having to open a winery to keep up with it. But, uh, when I met my husband, Chase, I was drinking mostly like Moscato. I loved me some barefoot Moscato that I could get at Walgreens for like $9.99. It was awesome. <laughs> and um, he's been a wine grape farmer since 2002. Mm -hmm. Up until a few years ago, he sold all of his grapes to other wineries. And then um, back in 2015, we started making our own wine, uh, first with Trilogy Cellars and okay. then uh, growing into Berkeley Hill Vineyards, which is our brand. Okay. Okay, great. So, so you, did you come from a farming family at all? Are you from that area? No, I had no background whatsoever in farming or wine or any of that. But uh, what has been really neat about it is I've been able to incorporate my law career in the winery industry. And so I help other people who want to get a winery permit. I help them get that. And it's it helps me in running our own business to know more about the legalities and the requirements. Yeah, I think that's really cool. So, and, and are you from, let, let me just put in context where you are. So you're in the Lubbock, Leveland area yes. of Texas, yes. which is in the northern part, um, what, in what we call the Panhandle, for those of you who are tuning in that aren't from Texas. So we, it's, it's up there. Um, and are you from that region originally, or how'd you make your way there if, if not? Well, so I am from, uh, I was born in Dallas, lived in East Texas for a little bit, and then uh, moved to West Texas near Odessa, a little bitty town called Crane, which in that area, it's mostly oil industry that dominates, uh, but came to tech and have stayed ever since. I love Lubbock, and it's really exciting to see how the wine industry is growing here. Yeah, I think that's so cool. So you have this background in law, or you still do, I mean, you're, you're in active attorney. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's still my day job. I, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that. But you guys decided, I mean, this is something big. So Chase, your husband, who's been growing since 2002, 
he worked with multiple wineries. How did y'all get to that point where you were like, I think, I think we're ready to bite off the next part of this pie or piece of this pie, right? Where it's like, okay, we, we know how to grow the grapes. We feel good about that. We've enjoyed, I'm assuming, the relationships you've built with the wineries you were selling to. But what's it like to decide, and now I think we want to be winemakers, you know? Well, it was a little bit scary, but it was yeah. exciting also. Luckily, the Texas wine industry, especially up here on the High Plains, is very much a community. And so we were able to rely on some of our friends that we'd made at wineries and actually had, you know, a couple of local wineries that helped us out those first couple of years. Mm -hmm. And that that helped so much, not only for the expertise, but just knowing the day-to-day -day procedure of how to get everything done. And so that's one thing that I really love about Texas in this area is uh, it's still very much a community supportive and uh, you'll see behind me, I have lots of other wineries wines in my yes. stash because we, we just love to support anyone here on the High Plains and in Texas in general. Yeah, I think that's something that as I've covered Texas wine over the past um, few years that there is that sense of community and you really, really feel it when you're in the growing region of the High Plains. It's like you guys, you know, not only is it just part of maybe a Texas culture of hospitality and friendliness, if you will, but there's this understanding that you guys struggle um, in terms of the farming aspect of growing grapes. And I'm just curious if you could share with people, like what are some of the struggles? We just talked about the freeze of, of last October and then the, the near, you know, scare this week. So what are some things that you guys lose sleep over? <laughs> Yeah, lots of options to name there. Uh, before this year, uh, last year was actually a bumper crop, which meant that we actually had a surplus of wine grapes. And that's something that we had been advocating at the legislature for uh, our belief that that was going to happen soon. And we wanted, uh, of course, and this is controversial, but we wanted the label requirements to increase to have, uh, you know, to be called a Texas wine for that to be higher, um, kind of like some of the other wine states have done. The minimum is 75%, but places like California and Oregon and Washington have gone up to 95 or 100%. Yeah. So that happened last year. We had uh, excess wine grapes. We still have quite a bit of bulk that we have either incorporated in our own winemaking or is for sale still. Yeah. And so I suppose that does help in years when you don't have any, any crop whatsoever. Uh, but that's been tough because you'll go from a bumper year where you can't even sell all of your grapes to a year where you don't have a harvest at all. So it's, it's tough for sure. But um, the, the year like this year is very rare. The last time we had it was in 2013. Yeah. But now we're concerned about next year. And that would be really devastating if we had two years in a row that were damaged that much by the weather. Right. So the, the vine, just to kind of give context, like the vine, if it hits that kind of level of winter freeze where it can't create a crop in the next year, it, there's still potential that that freeze damage is deeper even so that the following year could have trouble. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, the biggest problem is how early these freezes have been and the vines have not yet been completely dormant. Um, yes. They can, of course, there can be a really hard freeze in the middle of winter that can damage them. But the early freezes before they're completely dormant are especially hurtful. And that's the first time that has happened to us. Um, usually it's an early freeze in the spring, um, or I should say a late freeze in the spring that causes damages, not an early freeze in the fall. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's something that I think um, a lot of people in the Southwest region, so from Texas to Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, even even more so, they, they deal with that, that scare of the, free, the, the freeze when, when dormancy is not in place. Um, so I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned just because you brought it up, not me, um, which is this idea of labeling in Texas. And um, I, I think it's particularly interesting from the perspective of an attorney, right, who's dealing with the fine print on a regular basis. And I think that you're, you know, you've hit on something where a lot of consumers are not aware um, in Texas that it's completely legal 
um, under the federal law to be able to create a wine from Texas and put Texas as an appellation or place of origin um, and have 75% of that wine be from Texas, but 25% of it can be from somewhere else. Yes. Can you explain why people might have wanted to do that, especially in the earlier years of Texas? Why was that something, why is that a benefit to a wine producer? Well, early on, and we're still growing, of course, but early on, we did not have enough vineyards to support uh, the wine demand. And, and luckily, both the wine demand and the growing industry have grown in Texas. But there have been many years when uh, you could not make a completely Texas wine based on uh, the availability of the fruit. Yeah. And so that's kind of what we had been I, I don't want to say arguing, but debating with some in our own industry that I, we think we're closer to that than um, you think we're, we are. And That's sure enough, right. last year that happened. Um, but the good thing about what we have always proposed is that um, there would be exceptions for years like this year, whenever there's not a crop, if there's something weather related, it would be completely acceptable to go back to, for that one year, to go back to the minimum 75%. And that's actually written into the statute in places like Washington already. And so we've seen other states do that and it works well for them. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's what we always advocated. I helped write one of our first proposed statutes to add and was involved in that. And, uh, it's, you know, it's a debate between the growers like us and some of the bigger wineries. Uh, there's an argument that uh, it's tough to make an affordable Texas wine um, with all Texas wine grapes because at this time, Texas wine grapes are more expensive than some of the mass bulk that you can get from California, for example. And, you know, we, of course, argue that, that that's because it's much higher quality fruit and we're not mass producing. We have smaller vineyards and we're really caring for each acre. Uh, I think I may have paused there for a second, but... Um, <laughs> So that's kind of the debate. I think some of the larger wineries have really relied on that 25% that they can get out of California because it is less expensive and it's readily available usually. And so uh, I understand that piece of it. We just want to move and we've always advocated for a stair-step approach. Um, nothing, you know, all of a sudden dramatic, but, you know, increase it to 80. And then a couple of years later, maybe increase it to 85. There's a lot of different options. And we're hoping that sometime in the next few years that would happen. I think that's really, I think it's an, a, a very relevant topic right now. And I, I, I think it's interesting to note that we've had someone join us from Alto Adige. And uh, we have James Milton, uh, who's with us right now from New Zealand. And I think from their perspective, they might be like, what do you mean you make a wine that you say is from Texas, but not all of it's from Texas? Like, I can't imagine a New Zealand grape grower saying, hey, we're growing, you know, this is our Sauvignon Blanc, 25% of it's from Australia, but it's really good and it makes it more, you know, less expensive for you to buy. Um, so I think it's good to know the history of why maybe it's happened, but I would think that if we can stay on this track to move it towards a hundred percent or even, you know, like Washington or Oregon, like 95% that, um, you know, we could, we could kind of stand on a, a level field with these states that are recognized in America and then also across the world. Um, yeah. And that's been, I was just going to say, that's been our argument that we are, um, by all accounts, at least the fifth highest producing and consuming state. And we should take our role with those other top states in the United States, which have all, all of those ahead of us have already done this. Yeah. And so it should be the next, we should be the next one to do it. And yeah. so it's, it's tough. And of course, years like this year don't help our position. But as I mentioned, there is the exception for weather or damage, or even if there's a particular variety that you cannot source entirely from Texas, then you can blend uh, and ask for an exception there. There's, it's really very flexible. But I agree. I think the history of wine labeling goes to uh, the argument that it should be truth in labeling and not just this three quarters of it is from Texas and then you can call it a Texas wine.
Right, right. Um, check out, um, I'm going to mention to people too, y'all should check out, I'll post something a little bit later, but there is a way that you can actually weigh in on this topic with um, our legislators. I believe they're, they're collecting letters now to actually be able to put this into committee um, for this upcoming legislative session. So I love that we're bringing this up. Um, I think it's good to kind of take a stand. And, and for me, I mean, knowing now more and more of the growers, uh, I feel like how, how do you not get behind these people who are working and, and toiling all year long, uh, specifically when you're dealing with the challenges that y'all have? Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you this, because I think um, I think a question I get a lot of times, you know, I travel to different parts of the world and different wine regions. And one of the things that is the hot topic is uh, in wine growing is sustainability, um, organic and biodynamic. And I know that those um, topics all have kind of different interpretations and different uh, definitions, particularly the, the topic of sustainability. Um, and it's hard sometimes to explain, you know, that, that maybe in Texas, there are some places that would like to try to farm as organically as possible or things like that. But where do we have trouble in being able to do that 100%? Are you able to speak to that at all? I can, I can speak to it some. Um, I'm not necessarily an expert on it, but I, I definitely know what um, we've struggled with. Well, to go to the first mention of sustainability, here on the High Plains, wine grapes are a better crop to preserve water here. Uh, they take up less water than cotton, and we have a lot of friends that have been cotton farmers and have at least diversified and become both wine grape and cotton farmers. And so to go to sustainability, I think this area, there's a strong argument as to why wine grapes are one of the best uh, crops to have here, which has always been counterintuitive to me that uh, wine grapes, which are like juicy, would yeah. take less water than cotton, which is super dry. So it's just interesting how that works. Yeah. Uh, but as far as organic goes, I think the, the area that we struggle with out here on the high plains are pests. And so um, the, the balance is if you go organic, and I believe the Binghams tried this for many years, and they could probably speak to more of their decision making there. But you, you run this difficulty of um, going organic and having an extremely small crop because all of the pests uh, attacked the grapes or um, using smart uh, spraying chemicals or different things that we do use to keep the pests away and of course we also use some to keep mold and mildew away which is why places like um, the hill country in east texas um, do not grow as robust crops as we do here because we have a much drier climate which again has been uh, so interesting to me to learn about that uh, napa is very dry and yeah. Uh, here on the High Plains, we have a very similar um, climate. In fact, a few years back, and I'm sure you've, you've heard this before, but we've had some experts come in from California and talk about how our climate here may actually be better because we do get some rain occasionally during the summer, um, but not too much. And so, yes. of course, it just depends on the year. But uh, to sustainability and growing organic, that's our struggle. Um, but I know that that's a direction that many people are interested in and it's something we should continue to explore. And then what was the last um, uh, mention, the biodynamic, is mm -hmm. that what you said? Mm -hmm. And I'm not as familiar with that. I know that, um, you know, they are continually finding new ways to help us grow our crops and to innovate and do new things. And so uh, being the, uh, just the side, the, the lawyer who sits in an office, that's the extent of my knowledge on that kind of thing. That, no, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Um, and I'm curious, let's kind, of, let's kind of bring it back over to Berkeley Hill and kind of the wine specifically. When you guys decided to come up with uh, your wine program, I know that you mentioned, for instance, that your, your foray into wine drinking was with sweeter wines like Moscato. Um, yes. And I just want to mention that like one of the first wines that I had from you guys was, I believe, the, is it the Banasu? Is that how yes. you say yes. yes. Yeah. And the, yeah. And the Courtney, two white wines, uh, and it's the Banasu that is a little bit off dry, right? 
Yes, so it is made from muscat cannoli roots, yeah. and it is technically dry, but it's closer, it is pretty close to being off dry. Yeah. 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 Well, I remember tasting that, and when I'm evaluating wines, uh, Texas wines, you know, I'm, I'm a lot of times not, I'm not trying to think about, you know, well, what is it that I want to drink right now? I'm trying to think about, you know, all of the Texas drinkers and all of the preferences that people may have, and so when I try to, um, report and tell people what they should be drinking that's something that's on my mind like there are people who like some sweet who have some sweet preferences or or off dry preferences and i remember tasting that wine and just feeling like man this is first of all it's beautiful aromatics and such a pretty nose um, but it's super balanced and 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 yeah it's a little bit off dry but i think whoever likes a sweet wine and is kind of starting to move in the direction of dry wines this is like a perfect fit for that um <laughs> I call it my gateway wine. There you go. Yes, it totally is. Um, but, you know, it's really pleasant. It pairs very well with certain foods, especially like foods that have a little bit of spice to them or that need to kind of be balanced out. And so uh, I think it's a great one. And that's part of the reason that, you know, it's one of our wines that we will always have, um, partially because we grow so many muscat grapes. But, uh, yes, so we love the Manasu. <laughs> I love that. No, it's super great. So tell me actually, uh, what else do y'all grow? How, like, how many acres are y'all farming um, with the, it's, it, is it called the Berkeley Hill Vineyard or do y'all call it the vineyard itself something else? So because the uh, vineyard was established back in 2002 with Chase and his family, it is called Crook Hill, which is an acronym of Chase and his mom and dad and sisters. Um, okay. He's the C in the Crook. And so uh, we, um, have Berkeley Hill Vineyards uh, named after his grandfather and great grandfather, Burke and Eddie Lee. And it's actually, it, it's Burke has been in the family with multiple people. So it, it's neat to do that. And that's, that's part of the reason that we named it that uh, Berkeley, because it was kind of our own venture, but we still wanted to give a nod to the generations before us. That land um, where the vineyard is has been in the family for about 100 years. So it's a pretty oh cool goodness. story. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. And as you mentioned previously, I imagine it was being farmed with row crops, right? Like so cotton or peanuts or something or... Yes. Yeah. So they, um, I like to hear, they've never been afraid of trying something new or different. They've done, of course, the standard cotton. They've done alfalfa, peanuts. They, I've heard that they grew cucumbers for McDonald's salads at some point. In time. Wow. <laughs> so they've always been willing to try new crops. And so, uh, yeah, it was uh, farmed with all different kinds of crops over the years. And uh, I think that that lent itself to making them more open to try wine grapes. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about the varieties that you grow. You've, you've mentioned Muscat Canelli, which is great. Um, what are some grapes that, um, or what are some of the varieties that y'all have found are just doing really well and that you enjoy working with for your wine program? Well, so we love Malbec. It seems to be um, one of the best uh, wine grapes to grow in this area, and the Malbec wines have done very well. And as you probably know, right when we opened way back when in 2016, our Malbec won Best of Class in San Francisco. And so that was really the moment that we realized just how well Malbec grows here and what a great wine it makes. Yeah. So uh, that's also the one that is Chase's favorite variety to work with. It's a lot easier than some of the other um, varieties. But then we have the Cab that's harder to work with, does not produce as much of a robust crop that has done very well. Um, our brand new cab that we just bottled, um, I think we bottled it either in, in August, it immediately won gold at the San Antonio Rodeo. So cab still does well here, it's just not as much of a robust crop. We've yeah. also planted some Movedra um, and that actually has not put on a, a very large crop yet, but it's kind of in its um, initial stages. Uh, there's also some Montepulciano, and that's one of our um, signature wines that we really enjoy having. 
And then let's see, there's some Ruby Cab that can be used for blending or rosés, and we're using some of that to make um, a rosé, uh, hopefully in the spring or summer of next year. Yeah. And I'm probably, well, we actually have Zinfandel, which is probably the hardest to work with. I was um, going to say, that's bold. <laughs> that's bold for Texas. I know it doesn't do as well here, so. Yeah, okay. so the way Zinfandel works here is, about every five or six years, you can get a red sim, which we just bottled. Um, it's We don't have very many cases of it, but it was exciting to be able to make a red zen um, this yeah. past year. I guess it was a couple of years ago that we harvested that. Uh, but most years, because of the weather and kind of how um, it does not completely ripen, typically by the time we really need to take it off the vine, it ends up going into a white Zinfandel. And so it's it was really interesting to me to learn that, that it's the same grape. It's just how it ripens and develops and what the weather was like that year. Yeah. So, um, so those are our reds. I may be missing one, but we also have several whites. And, and to go back to your question, we have 55 acres and some of it's been planted, you know, 18 years, some of it's been planted two or three. So it's just been kind of growing over the years. Um, whites, we mentioned the muscats, we have Riesling, um, Malvasia Bianca, which I always hesitate because it's a hard one to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I'm trying to think what else uh, we have out there. I'm probably missing one or two. Um, Chase can always rattle them off, but yeah. we have about, I think, eight to 10 varieties. So Okay, that's great. And I'm glad you men mentioned the Montepulciano. I feel like that's a great that has done really well in Texas, um, but it's kind of flown under the radar a little bit. And yet... <laughs> For the Montepulciano single variety wines that I've had from different producers, it, it, they end up always being like rising to the top where I'm like, that has a lot of character and it has more than I expected it to have. And with yours, that was the first time I tried that. I, that was one of my one of my favorites of the evaluation. It was really cool. Oh, good. Yeah, we were really pleased with it. That was kind of like our first red that we released. And we were thrilled with it. And it's, you know, it's a little bit lighter bodied than um, some of the others, but it's really, it, it has such smooth um, notes and some really neat character. And so we've been really happy with it. That's great. I think that's really great. And I think it's great to be able to talk about kind of the diversity of varieties that we're still kind of exploring in Texas. I mean, I think we've hit on some really great warm climate varieties. Um, but as you mentioned, we have Riesling and we have, you know, I mean, like Zinfandel, which again, let's, that's probably maybe not our long-term great, but we can yeah. do Riesling and it, it takes on a, a little bit of a different character. Um, do you, I think, did you know, share me uh, law very well. Yes. Yeah. So that's our fruit that I, okay. is in her very first um, release. And I just remembered we also grow Chenin Wonk, but um, okay, good. yeah, so it was neat because Jeremy had done some, um, you know, wine repping for us. And so uh, when she started looking uh, at what wine she wanted, it, it led her to our vineyard. So uh, that's been fun to see uh, the Jeremy wine uh, move forward. Yeah, I think it's really cool. And, and I'm glad you mentioned Chenin Blanc too. So Riesling and Chenin being grapes that a lot of times we're associating more with cool climate, but then we can't forget places like Australia and South Africa where it does, these do well um, in the warmer climate. So um, people often ask me, I, I would never have imagined that you grow grapes in a region that's, you know, commonly associated with tumbleweeds and very flat landscape and dust wind, you know, dust devils and stuff like that. Um, and I like to remind them that, you know, yes, it's dry and windy, um, <laughs> but because it sits on the Llano Estacado Mesa, it sits at an elevation that has that 3,500 to 4,500 feet, depending on where you are. And so y'all can get that diurnal shift. And so for grapes like Riesling or Shannon, yes, you may get really hot days during the growing season, but because y'all can cool off so significantly in the evening, it helps those grapes kind of settle down a little bit, if you will. 
Yeah, that's I, my understanding is that is one of the major advantages that we have our hot days and cool nights and even the wind apparently because we have a lot of wind here blowing those tumbleweeds as you mentioned, yeah. even the wind helps on occasion because it blows off any moisture or anything that has started to form that might eventually turn into mold or mildew. So yeah. that uh, is interesting to see because you're right, it's it's very it's a lot of vast, flat um, land that doesn't have many trees. And so to see a, a you know, robust green vineyard in the middle of that, it's just kind of wild. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so cool. And I love that you're kind of discovering this for yourself in a lot of ways, right? Like, like you said, this is not, not something you thought you'd ever do in your life. So it's kind of neat to be like on the ground, just discovering it, at, you know, from vintage to vintage. Um, I know Chase, I know Chase is like, He's the one that's in the dirt on a regular basis, but I yeah. love that. Um, <laughs> by, by osmosis, you're having to learn it as well. <laughs> yes. I always say we grow wine grapes, and by we, I mean my husband. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Well, before we go, I want to know a little bit about uh, the recent opening that you guys did during a really hard time uh, in 2020. Y'all opened um, a, can I call it restaurant or how would, it's a tasting room, but also restaurant. <laughs> It is. It is both. Yes. Okay. In in downtown Lubbock, in a really cool historic building, the Crest Building. Yes. Um, and I got to see it when it was under construction. Uh, but then you guys opened like in February, and then COVID hit. Like, what's the scoop? Yeah. So we opened. Um, we kind of had some soft openings before, but we opened to the public on March fourth. And we, uh, I think our last day to serve before the shutdown was March 20th. So we literally had about two weeks that we were open and then had to shut down. So I like to say that we opened at the worst possible time in history, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's been okay. And uh, we actually, you know, we had this vision to do something a little bit different than a lot of wineries do. We, we like um, the winery structure where you go in and have tastings, but from our experience with our location in Loveland, we continued mm -hmm. to hear people mentioning that, well, I get, I drive 30 minutes to get here and then I sit down and I have the wine and I feel like I can't have too much because there's no food. And, and yeah. so they get up and leave. And so we decided um, to add food. And initially it was going to be more limited, like charcuterie and maybe some pizzas. Uh, but what happened is we, as we developed that and we tried really hard to have just unique and delicious recipes, uh, we do hand tossed pizzas and it just turned into more. And so what's incredible about that is it saved us this year. Um, we were one of the only wineries in the state that could stay open all summer. Uh, we all, everyone back, opened back up on May 1st, but we started having an increase in cases in June and all of the, the bars or any other um, entity that served more alcohol than food had to close. Yeah. And so we did some calculations and we actually met the 51% rule by just a little bit, but it's been yeah. consistent every month. We're around 53, 54% food. And so that, I mean, we could stay open and it was incredible. And uh, that has been very helpful. Uh, of course, it's been tough and we are still trying to spread the word about what we offer and what we do because just not as many people are getting out right now, which is completely understandable. Right. Absolutely. But it, it is, it is a shame and I, I'm not, I'm hopeful. I'm always an optimist, right? I think there's going to be a, a time when people can really come and enjoy that space because it is beautifully done. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the back half is supposed to be an event room. So that right. also was, that yeah. was, that was unfortunate for this year, but what has been so cool about that is what we've done is we took all of our tables up front and we spread them out between the front area and the back event room so yeah. that we yeah. could, um, you know, keep all our tables six feet apart, make sure we didn't go over capacity. Right now we're back down to 50% capacity because we've had an uptick of cases here in Lubbock and we're already set up to do that. And so yeah. 
<laughs> we just tried to take everything and look on the positive side of it that, hey, we did have food. We have this back room that we can spread out into and give people more space um, when they're here. And uh, so it's been okay, but it's it's been an interesting year for sure. <laughs> My gosh. I mean, seriously, when you consider how hard the vintage was, you got COVID trying to open a restaurant. I mean, at least you got your law practice, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> and yeah, that's been consistent. So that's really the only thing in our life right now that's consistent. So I have to just keep keep doing that. I love practicing law anyway, so I think I always will. But, um, you know, that's been good to have a career that I could do from home if needed. I'm at home right now. And so uh, that's been that's been helpful. But yes, it's been an interesting year. And uh, the building, the Crest building, we are probably list the coolest building in Lubbock. It's really gorgeous. It's very art deco on the inside, which I think lends itself to a modern interpretation, which we've done. And so it's also a historic building and that's been neat. So it's it's been fun. We continue to have a good time with it and we're just trying to do our best, make sure we follow all the precautions and, and make it an enjoyable experience. Right, right. Well, I can't wait to come up and visit. Um, I am hoping that can be sooner rather than later. <laughs> but it was great to see it under construction. And now, and I've seen some pictures since it's been finished, but I, I really had hoped that, you know, had COVID not happened, I would have been there a lot sooner, for sure. Yes. Um, well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time today. It's It's been so great to just kind of circle back with all these people in this, this wine community of not only Texas, but New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. Um, and I hope that, you know, when you're not busy, you get a chance to sit down and, and read this book. <laughs> I'm so excited to you and I'm sure you let people know. I feel like I can't can't stop this before making sure those who are not familiar with Texas wine know that we grow the vast majority of wine grapes here on the Texas High Plains. So yeah. I'm glad we oh my gosh, I can't believe I feel like I say that a lot. I'm like always I know, like, I forget the to. for the high yeah. plains. But it is always the big surprise for people. They're like, Yeah, no, but aren't the aren't all the wineries in the hill country and it's so pretty and all of that? And I'm like well, yeah, but <laughs> they truck their grapes like 400 miles from yeah. the high plains. Yeah. And they, just, yeah, it's a lot. Um, yeah. It's My a understanding lot. is they do now admit that the wine is from the high plains, and it's become more of a selling point of that's the place to grow wine grapes. But years and years ago, um, I don't think that was always revealed um, whenever people were visiting in the hill country. Well, I think, you know, in a lot of ways, it was such a disconnect. And, mm -hmm. but now it's not, and that's good. Um, and I think with the things that you guys are doing, like, um, like the restaurant in this historic Crest building, you know, McPherson opening in the old Coca-Cola um, uh, bottling facility, but then places like White House Parker out in Brownfield. And, and there's places now, things are starting, the new Nicolette that's opening. Yes, um, have I'm you excited seen? about that. Yeah, yeah I, I can't wait to go on a date there. It looks really I know, awesome. I want to go on a date there. <laughs> it yeah. sounds really great. Yeah. Um, but I feel like one thing people, uh, one thing I'm always struck by is actually how beautiful it is in the High Plains. I know that sounds strange to some, but I, I think this, there's this stark beauty out there. And I think that the more we see new restaurant places to open, places to stay, we can start building a community of, of, of a destination really out, out there that people will want to travel to as well. And I, I don't think that's far off. I think that's in the future. Yeah. And what's neat about it is where we are in down, downtown is kind of considered the hub of what we're trying to do for the tourism industry in Lubbock. And we have a really, really good agency, Visit Lubbock, that has just embraced and promoted not only downtown and all of Lubbock, but the wine industry as well. And so I, I'm hoping that Lubbock will be added to everyone's bucket list of where to go see wineries, taste wines, maybe see a vineyard and see a really yeah. cool town. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to like cross all my fingers and toes that that happens. Yeah. I, think, I think it's worth yeah. it. It's one of my favorite uh, kind of like undiscovered places to come and visit. Um, and yeah. maybe that's because I like the people too. I mean, y'all yeah. are great. So 
Yeah. Well, and we have the Buddy Holly Hall is going to open at yes. some point soon, and that's going to be um, one of the most incredible uh, venues and music halls um, in Texas, and so that's going to be exciting. Buddy Holly is from Lubbock, in case y'all are wondering about the name. So yeah, I know I forget about that. We kind of yeah. take that for granted too, but yeah, that's where that's his birthplace. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again for your time. I think this has been so fun and I can't wait to kind of see what this next year brings for you guys. Hopefully a lot of prosperity. <laughs> thank you, Jessica. This has been so fun to chat with you and thank you for featuring the High Plains. Absolutely. I'm happy to. All right, Elizabeth, I hope you have a great afternoon. And for all of you out there, uh, if you want to read more about Texas wine, Colorado wine, Arizona, and New Mexico wine, please check out, uh, check out my book, The Wines of Southwest USA. You can check it out um, through my link in the bio. And I'll send you a signed copy. All right. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, Jessica. Bye-bye.